In 1829, Robert Stevenson invented the fire tube boiler by connecting tubes to the furnace, passing through water, ensuring even heating and greater steam production. However, he was stumped on how to connect round tubes to steel plates. Without a higher heat source, they could only heat iron until it was red hot. And then, hammer it. An experienced craftsman solved the problem by extending the tube slightly, flattening it on a special anvil. This efficient boiler was key to the Stevenson's success in the Rainhill trials. Heating iron until red hot and hammering it together is forge welding. Casting welding involves pouring molten copper or iron into gaps to solidify. The East used it to create exquisite bronzeware. We use soldering irons and flames to melt solder for circuit welding, known as soft soldering. These traditional welding methods have been used for centuries. Higher temperature sources were only in labs at the time. In the early 19th century, it was trendy for British elites to attend science lectures. The superstar chemist of the Royal Society, Humphrey Davy, was charismatic and handsome, making his lectures lively. Ladies pretended to take notes, and nobles took turns assisting Davy. The sparks, explosions, and odors from experiments thrilled the audience. Every lecture caused traffic jams outside, requiring police to direct carriages. Davy built a massive battery with copper and zinc plates and acid, filling the entire basement. With this battery, Davy discovered many elements and extracted reactive alkali metals, making his lectures even more exciting. Davy found that this device could pierce air, creating a bright arc between electrodes. In 1809, he invented the arc lamp. It required a lot of batteries and was cumbersome. However, it was very bright, leading to tall lighting towers in cities for outdoor illumination. The high temperature of the arc was due to carbon vapor between carbon rods, reaching over 6,000 degrees. This was humanity's first high temperature heat source, leading to the idea of using it for welding, known as arc welding. In 1856, Joule proposed another electrical method, resistance welding. With small contact areas and high resistance, passing current could also generate high temperatures, melting steel and pressing it together. Arc and resistance welding con...
Twelve years after aluminum mass production, Hans Goldschmidt invented thermite, using chemical energy to achieve high temperatures. Mixing aluminum powder and iron oxide in a certain ratio, igniting it produced aluminum oxide and molten iron with a violent reaction reaching 3,000 degrees. It became the standard method for welding railroad tracks, still in use today. Both carbide and aluminum powder are produced by electrolysis, essentially using electricity. With technological advances, the shortcomings of electric welding were gradually resolved. First, power sources capable of continuously releasing strong currents appeared. In 1905, Germany developed welding generators. With the spread of AC power, cheap and energy-efficient welding transformers finally solved the problem. Then, electrode improvements came. In 1907, Swedish Kelberg invented electrode coating components. Complex components like white crocodile and potassium carbonate ionize to stabilize the arc. Cold minerals like marble are used for slag separation. Starch and sawdust form carbon-rich protective gases. Manganese and silicon are used for deoxidation and alloy formation. These components in hollow electrodes are called flux cord wires. The coating improved welding stability, forming the foundation of modern welding. These two improvements marked the beginning of welding's widespread adoption. With gas and electric welding, the U.S. saw the first all-steel car using resistance welding technology. But soon the Gatling gun appeared. People thought mass destruction weapons had arrived, and no one could bear it, thinking there would be no more wars. Unexpectedly, World War I began. Machine guns first appeared, tanks with machine guns and planes roamed, and once the battle heated up, there were no taboos. After the war, the losers wanted revenge, and the winners feared retaliation, always feeling unfinished. The survival competition drove countries to develop, leading to more welding inventions. The strong light from welding required workers to wear goggles. These light, heat, and sparks were energy losses, and people tried to reduce waste. In 1930, Soviet Robinov invented submerged arc welding, using granular flux to bury the arc, reducing energy loss, allowing larger currents, and improving weld quality and efficiency. Based on this, the 1930s saw the emergence of automated welding processes in the U.S. Post-WWI, all metal aircraft used a lot of aluminum alloys. To prevent aluminum from reacting with air at high temperatures in 1926, Hobart and... DeVos proposed using helium and argon as protective gases to isolate air, enabling aluminum alloy and stainless steel welding. Initially, inspection involved hammering and using stethoscopes to discern sounds. In 1924, the U.S. first used X-ray photography to inspect weld seams, checking for pores and cracks, solving welding quality issues. During the brief interwar peace, many welding technologies emerged. To bypass post-WWI treaty restrictions, Germany began using welding extensively in shipbuilding to reduce warship weight. In the U.S., hundreds of kilometers of oil pipelines were welded. All welded merchant ships, railway bridges, warehouses, and factories appeared. Steel structured skyscrapers rose higher, with New York's wealthy engaging in a height competition. Two years later, in 1931, steel structured Empire State Building was from showcasing welding's power. War. Broke out again, with countries ramping up weapon production. Welding was widely used in military equipment production. Germany studied armor welding techniques in detail, using interlocking structures for protection and armor bolts for reinforcement. The battlefield revealed the Tiger and Panther tanks, causing psychological shadows for the Allies. In aviation in 1941, American Russell Meredith perfected the tungsten arc welding process, using tungsten electrodes, cooling with argon protection, effectively welding aluminum-magnesium alloys, greatly speeding up aircraft construction, a huge success. Roosevelt boasted about it in a letter to Churchill. Welding technology revolutionized American shipbuilding. Using riveting, ships could only be built by first constructing the keel frame and then gradually building up. With welding, ships could be built in sections and welded together, achieving parallel and modular construction. 
During Wobi War II, the U.S. mass-produced 30 million tons of transport ships, breaking the German submarine blockade strategy, delivering massive supplies to the front lines, strongly supporting the Allies. Welding, unlike riveting, didn't require much strength, making it suitable for patient and meticulous women. After the U.S. entered the war and drafted soldiers, many women filled manufacturing jobs. Rosie the Riveter became a symbol of women at the time, widely promoted in ads, recruitment posters, and cartoons. The war pressured everyone.